So I hand over immediately to Joe, who is going to provide us with the record, recorded presentation by Emilio. Okay, Joe. I think you're already in place. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I would like to thank, thank you. Thank God. Peter Mario for thank inviting you. me to, to, to participate in this event. And at the same time, I, I have to ask for apologize well, for not being here in, in, yeah, well, yeah. Uh, in direct, only in, with this well, yeah. record that I hope that works uh, as better as I can to, to, to record a, a domestic uh, video. Oh, can you raise the sound uh, a bit? I, I, uh, I have decided to... Uh, That's the best I can go, Peter. That's the best you can do. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Because it was recorded uh, quite... Um, right. Uh, what about the, 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 the shot? It stopped now. I stopped it to talk. Uh, okay. 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 So we'll go with the best you can do. do right. Um, more... Uh, personal reflection about the, the Raymond Williams focus or starting from uh, <coughs> my own context in a double sense for, sense. for on the one hand the my academic context I, I work at the University of Seville and on the other my uh, the context of my own country uh, in terms of the, the, my, my academic context, uh, I think that it is important to 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 to, folk, to, to stress that in the field of adult education, Raymond William in the academy is I, I am talking a, in a general view is a, a no thinker. Uh, the, the, the the adult education in Spain is. is more focus in the contribution for Latin America and overall in the contribution from uh, basically Paulo Freire. Um, uh, Raymond William is, is uh, less uh, research in, in, in Spain and sometimes is kind, including also from marginal research in the field of of adult, of adult education. The second uh, element of the context is uh, related with my own country. Um, we have uh, 52 uh, fascist parliaments in the, in the state parliament at present time. And we can ask ourselves what happened because the country uh, returned from a dictatorship that, um, some years ago and suddenly all the, 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 the things related with the dictatorship uh, are suddenly appears in the uh, political uh, scenario. And we have uh, Greek uh, reactions against one or two elements that are very, very, very uh, important in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, in Spain. One is that Spain is a multinational state full of plenty of diversity, plenty of uh, different uh, nations and with uh, different uh, cultural uh, traditions. Uh, and this is a very, very important fact that uh, at present time is uh, denied. The second element is that Spain is a country of migrant people, for instance. In the 60s of uh, past uh, century, around 
two and a half million people uh, migrated from Andalusia to other uh, cities in Spain and to other countries in Europe, France, Germany, Switzerland, and others. Now, to the contrary, we are receiving um, migrant people that are essential to maintain the uh, productive system in the in Spain. And, and at this moment, it's very difficult to understand Spain economy without reference to the important and very, very rich presence of migrant people. But we uh, are, uh, we found uh, two uh, was present in, in, in Spain. And I think that maybe uh, we can uh, recover some of the contribution of Raymond William to, to, to talk about this. A, a last element of this context is a more general element that is, is related to the policies and practices of lifelong learning that uh, has lost also the diversity of adult education in Europe, but has also lost the idea that adult education is a, an education to um, potentiate the development of the individual and the communities and has reduced adult education only to a, to a moment to prepare to become employable and to uh, uh, is only useful to uh, search for job only useful to become worker or consumer but not uh, citizen and in this uh, a double scenario in, in in my country and this scenario at the european level i think that the major contribution uh, of Raymond William, in my opinion, is related to the concept of culture. Because I think that we have lost the, the cultural battle. We have, or maybe we have renounced to, 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 to have the, 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 the to, to organize a cultural battle, to uh, organize a new way of thinking. And we have, uh, Thing that only change the economic situation, we can change the, the mentalities. And um, maybe we have to return to the idea that uh, we have to work in the building uh, of a different hegemony, more worried by the planet, by the health, by the people, and by the nature, etc. So, Apart from the idea that culture is the ordinary, is a way of life, for me it's very interesting that the, the, the definition that, or part of the definition that Raymond William presented in the keyword, that stressed that culture in plural. There are, uh, this is a celebration of diversity. And it is, for instance, in the, in the present time, is, is very important, for instance, in Spain, because this celebration of the diversity is the celebration of the diverse uh, language, diverse nation, diverse culture that come not, not, not only in Spain, in the different uh, nation in, inside Spain, but also uh, in the uh, culture that the people coming from uh, outside Spain uh, bring uh, with them. Uh, this is for me is important to uh, make visible the difference uh, because I, I think that we uh, at the moment witness a, a, a situation of total homogenization of the reality and I think that we have to celebrate and to make visible 
the difference, the diversity, and to uh, uh, organ to think in a in a in a in culture in plural, as Raymond William said, uh, enable us to uh, uh, can think about this. This, uh, this diversity of the loss of diversity that, for instance, from the, from the uh, certain position in our parliament, represented by the, the fascist parliamentaries mainly, but not only, uh, this loss of, 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 of diversity is not only related with the, 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 the nature, with the environment, it's related to culture, to language. Uh, paraphrasing John Don. Uh, it is possible to say that uh, this love of diversity uh, uh, diminishing uh, the, 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 the human king. And uh, it is important to recover the, this concept of culture as diversity, as, uh, um, as a plural uh, organization, or a plural uh, way of, of life. As I say uh, a moment, I think that it is a cultural battle that we have to do. Maybe it's the wrong, the long, maybe it's the long revolution that uh, Raymond Williams uh, thought about. Uh, and uh, we have, uh, we are not in situation to, to renounce, to organize this cultural battle, and to. Um, organize this new uh, way of thinking and starting from the culture of the people. I think, for instance, that in this way, the, co the concept of criticism uh, drawn on by Raymond William is also very important as a point where the uh, classic culture and the popular culture can uh, join. So, for me, the most important is to consider that uh, adult education is a privileged space for this battle, and it's also and we have to organize this battle to um, maintain and profound, or maybe only to build a democratic society that maybe in this moment uh, is in a little danger. Uh, thank you so much, and I hope that you uh, can uh, dialogue with uh, in this in this afternoon. Thank you so much. You don't have to. I know I have to unmute. Um, okay. Difficulty trying to hear and understand what was being said. Um, spoke in a very soft tone. Um, certainly, uh, the links between the, the long revolution and uh, the relation, the re reality of Spain, from where Emilio is, and the struggles for adult education for Spain. Now, I will go to the next speaker, who is about to present a book, to publish a book. I know it's already in press on education in Raymond Williams on education. And that's, um, that is something we, no, sorry, sorry, I, well, is it? Yeah, it should no, be no, Lyndon. No, 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 it's Lyndon, in Lyndon West right now, Lyndon West, uh, very much. We already saw your picture in the presentation by Sharon Clancy. Uh, uh, Lyndon West is quite an authority on Raymond Williams. Um, wow. uh, yesterday, I was speaking to Professor Ronald Sultana, and he told me, that he had attended once a seminar on Raymond Williams, and I mentioned Lyndon West, and he said, yeah, that's the person who was involved. Uh, Lyndon, uh, I, I know you're on. Um, you're going to speak to a paper with this title, In Border Country. That's the title of one of his, his novels. Raymond Williams, excuse me for this mis the, the spelling error there. It's Williams and not Williams, of course. Raymond Williams and the Structures of Democratic Feeling. Now, this is a very interesting thing because structures of feeling is one of the terms which is strongly associated with Raymond Williams. 
and we struggled even through discussions on the meaning who's we we i mean me and colleagues who are interested of that phrase and i hope lyndon will clarify this to us so lyndon williams from canterbury christchurch university united kingdom the, the screen and the mic is yours thank you peter um joseph can we share the uh powerpoint yes of course um just a second while uh while joseph is bringing up the powerpoint i just want to say thank you um peter for the invitation to be part of this uh fest i love that word i, I gather you've had a heavy week with various fests as you said including frere so you're doing very very well hmm. And I want to celebrate the 100th anniversary of uh, Raymond's birth too. I'm not sure I would claim to be a particular authority on Raymond. He's just with me a lot and has been in recent times. I feel I'm in a, a kind of perpetual dialogue with him. Um, and in the context of work I've been doing on um, racism, on the rise of racism and fundamentalism in post-industrial contexts, um, thinking to what Sharon said as well, I've been in dialogue with others, like Richard Henry Tawney, um, Edward Thompson, um, and historians like Jonathan Rose and Lawrence Goldman. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the work that's being done there is in, in, in Thompson's glorious phrase, it's rescuing workers' education and the history of workers' education from the enormous condescension of posterity. I think celebrating particularly its contribution, um, especially after the First World War, but also before it to the development of British social democracy and maybe more widely. <coughs> I mentioned Jonathan Rose's work, and some of you will be familiar with the intellectual history of the British working classes, which I think was an important contribution to our literature and to an understanding of the uh, of the traditions, uh, because. I think Jonathan Rose reminds us of the importance of a focus on the detail of people's lives and testimony in historical and sociological judgment. People matter in processes of progressive social change. And there's a suspicion, I think, and a justified su suspicion of overly abstract forms of sense making that are remote from lived experience. I think Raymond and I would have agreed on that. Raymond's roots, as you know, um, are in the small organic community of Pandy in border country between England and Wales. And I think, um, echoing Jonathan Rose, that people are always there in the landscape, in both his imaginative, his novels, and also maybe a little bit more hidden, but nonetheless there in his conceptual work. I don't think he ever really left Pandy in a certain sense. It's there and enormously shapes what he thought, what he felt and what he wrote. I'd like briefly to talk on three things. I, I'd like to just share with you my joy um, at his novel, Border Country. And it's important to me and why I think it's important more, more generally is how I really got into Raymond Williams. Secondly, and it, it's a theme I want to emphasize, um, Raymond's antipathy towards seeing people as masses, and that too easily happens. And then thirdly, a little bit on workers and adults, education, yes, Peter, and its importance in creating structures of democratic feeling and resources of hope. Uh, and a brief final point on hope and despair in present times. And I suggest um, being attentive to a range of possibilities. Next slide, Joe, please. <clears throat> so Border Country, the novel, I mean, it's been criticized as a bit clunky, as not particularly well written. I loved it. Um, as with novels that we like, it kind of spoke to me about my experience. Um, I think there is um, um, a fascinating main plot, maybe, of the relationship between uh, a father 
and a son. And uh, a son, it's mainly autobiographical, the novel, a son who deeply respects his father. Um, but there's a difficulty of communication um, at that time and maybe still now men having difficulty doing um, intimacy. But the sense of the importance of his father there is there um, preeminently in, in, in the novel and in the quality of writing. And I think it's the, the quality of the writing and the attention to detail and the detail of lived experience that really makes that novel come alive. Now, Peter, the notion of democratic structures of democratic feeling is there in the novel. Um, there is a moment in a signal box in the British general strike of 1926, where a structure of democratic feeling came to life. Democratic feeling, a new possibility for selves, individually and collectively among a group of men accustomed to taking instructions from bosses and managers. Glimpses here, I think, to, to pick up on the point that Sharon made of what's really needed in any long revolution and any inclusive progressive social change. And Williams writes about this in Resources of Hope, and here I quote, at the level of national history, big time politics, the general strike is written off as anything from a disaster to a mistake. But the part of the history that needs most emphasis, and it was actually very evident in that country station and in thousands of other places up and down the country, was the growth of consciousness during the action itself. The confidence, the vigor, the practical self-reliance. It was the steady and remarkable self-realization of the capacity of a class in the detailed discussion on the railways about priority traffic and exception traffic. Here was an experience of decision-making of quite a new kind, not just instrumental, but from the bottom up as a way of deciding who came first in the society, what mattered in it, what needs and values we live by and want to live by in that station, the positive confidence grew. I think that's a, a lovely insight into the emergence of a structure of democratic feeling. If you want to think about it more psychologically or socially, we can do, but there isn't time just now. I think the structures of democratic feeling for, for Raymond were rooted in the best of the Welsh trapple nonconformist culture, uh, a resistance to hierarchy, uh, the Bible being accessible to all, the divine could speak through all, everyone was a potential theologian, and of course, I'm talking about an ideal here, and, and often there were many, many exceptions to the ideal. Everyone had the right to speak and claim space. And in Martin Buber, the Austrian theologian's compelling words, I thou qualities of interaction in the best of this um, culture. Can we move on, um, Joe? <clears throat> I think Raymond was deeply uh, exercised by the way we see people um, as masses and not people. Massification in communism and consumerist capitalism, not I thou, but I it. And here's Raymond speaking again or writing again. There are in fact no masses, but only ways of seeing people as masses. With the coming of industrialization, much of the old social organization broke down. We were constantly seeing people we did not know, and it was tempting to mass them as the others in our minds. Masses become a new word for the mob. The others, the unknown, the unwashed, the crowd beyond. I wonder if we've ever done that. Um, ourselves in some of the assumptions we make and some of the remarks we make. Raymond suggested it was true of the authoritarian left as much as of the capitalists in their marketing. He also thought it was true of the laborist tradition 
and was true of Fabian thought as, as well. What he said about um, the left, the authoritarian left and the advertisers were the advertising men and women held the same essential dehumanizing view of the masses as the authoritarian left. Expensively educated people now in the service of the most brazen money grabbing exploitation of the inexperience of ordinary people. Thinking of the victims as a slow, ignorant crowd. One kind of communist has always talked of the ignorant masses and has got his answer in Budapest in 1956, of course, where in the name of the working class, the tanks were turned against the working class. I think there's a profound insight there in Raymond's work and a profound warning for those tempted by more authoritarian responses to the crises we face. And of course, you could argue those, those, uh, those forms of manipulation, particularly in global capitalism, are getting worse. And, and Raymond himself pointed to some of that in Towards 2000, what he termed a long counter-revolution led by the forces of global capital and its political allies. Communities hollowed out, some of which I've been researching. People perpetu perpetually manipulated as consumers and the planet violently abused for greater capital accumulation. I, it, not I, thou, at all levels. I know that Raymond didn't major on eco-socialism, but he was beginning to write about that, of course, towards the end of his life. He talked about the seduction of capitalist goods as a kind of magic, a sort of ever more in the phraseology of Eugene, Eugene McGarricker, whose book is there on the slide, as a sort of ever more manipulative religion, using diverse media, of course, including social media. A religion, I don't think that religion ever particularly disappeared. I think it's there in a certain sense in the religious formations we call shopping malls. A religion bringing a promise of a good life, but empty of substance and any lasting satisfaction, a source of social and cultural disease. And the next slide, please, Joe. So let me just have a moment in, in workers' education where, where I've worked, and I know a number of people here have, have worked. And I think the rescue of um, workers' education and its profound contribution reminds us of its important freedoms that too often, as Sharon was indicating right at the outset, have been lost. Just a few, no exams. The subjects of study were negotiated. You could spend time, a long time, with one or a small number of texts. You weren't ruled by the tyranny of examinations. There was at best a respect for lived experience alongside academic ways of knowing. It wasn't always easy, but I think that was the intent. At best, I think all were teachers and all were learners. Transitional spaces, which is a phrase I use, where people could take risk with who I am, have been and might become. Nervous, diffident students could take risks with the good tutor and take a step towards the center of space and claim some agency, I think, in the best of those classes. In other words, expanding the structure of democratic, inclusive feeling, microcosms of the kingdom, echoing Tawny and the religious ideas, or participative democratic learning, even, dare I say, to the microscopic level, or microcosm rather, even of socialism. Raymond, as you uh, pointed out, Peter taught in uh, for the extra Oxford extramural delegacy from 1946 to 61 in places like Hastings and uh, Bexhill, which is not far from where I am here in, in Canterbury. And he also taught minors summer schools in Oxford. And I think we have evidence. There's quite an interesting discussion about how Raymond was as a teacher, but I think we have glimpses of how 
Raymond could respond to particular individuals and their struggles. And the evidence here comes from the excellent book you cited, Peter, uh, which is John McElroy and Sally Westwood's book uh, in border country, mainly uh, Raymond's work in the unknown territory of adult education, unknown, that is, to certain um, intramural academics. So there's a minor in the Ashmolean during a summer school. Um, and in the summer school, they're experimenting with being encouraged to write. And, and he's trying to write something about his experience down the pit and what it feels like to be oppressed, crawling along a narrow seam and sweating and frightened and finding this alongside the sense of the solidarity that comes out of that, for sure. And they're touring the Ashmolean and Raymond's, Raymond notices the, um, the minor at the back, kind of waiting, not joining in with the rest. So he wanders across. And he has a conversation and he says, is everything OK? And the, the minor says, I wished, I wished. So they have a conversation. I wished I could write. And Raymond says to him, OK, I, I understand. Let's, let's try and draw the experience to get something going. And they have a, a, a lovely conversation. Now, I'm, I'm not pretending here there was some kind of revolution, but I am pretending in this attention to detail we have the facilitation of someone to begin to play a more confident part in the summer school. The second example I give, and Raymond didn't hold back, but it's the old George Bernard Shaw remark, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. There was a female student in a tutorial class in 1953, and she was writing on Conrad's secret agent describing a scene waiting for her husband at Brighton Station wartime. Quote, a train disgorged like some giant whale with a distaste for fish that day. Masses, there we go again, masses of men on their way to football. Not one of them looked handsome, good or clever. A dirty, dingy mass, depressing and dead. Raymond in discussion pointed out that he, someone she respected, had arrived by train at Brighton during the same period, presumably disgorged, dirty and dread. They laughed and there was movement on in that particular relationship. I love that attention to the detail, but also the humanity that comes through Raymond's relationships with many of his students. And I know there are different interpretations of this, but I think the detail does help us to understand what Raymond was like, actually, with at least some of his students. A footnote on all this. Raymond recognized, of course, there were enemies within workers and adult education, people who had all the truth and nothing but the truth. And some of those teachers were there in tutorial classes, whether they were the marketeers or whether they were one version of, or one, one kind of communist, as, as Raymond called it. And of course, that sense that I know I have the truth and nothing but the truth stifles the kind of the possibilities of the structure of democratic feeling and inclusive engagement with a subject which I think is at the heart of what Raymond was struggling to create. Okay, the next slide, Joseph, please. So I don't know, I don't know where you are in your, your thoughts at the, 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 the moment about the state we're in. It can feel um, awful, troubled, fractious, um, fragile, sometimes violent world. world. I, I love, Raymond's quote here, making resources of hope practical, despair, unconvincing. And we have lots to feel uh, despair about. But I also think actually, and if we think of the point that Sharon made at the beginning that adult education is actually about a society becoming more conscious of itself. I think we have a whole set of issues where this process is being engaged with, if also resisted. It's a kind of curriculum, if you like, 
for a revitalized form of adult education. And I would include in my kind of potential resources of hope, things like ecological resacralization, a change from I, it to I, thou, a challenge to unsustainable capitalism. I think I would include learning of gender and the Me Too movement. I think I'd mention Black Lives Matter, slavery, and British history. And it, that shows how much his, history can be a means to the redefinition of memory and allowing space for memory to be revitalized and for social justice to find greater space. I think there's new consciousness of uh, emotional and relational learning in health, nurseries, childcare, universities, and of course, during the panic. And one thing that um, Sharon alluded to, I think the, in, the, in the United Kingdom, the campaign for adult education in 2019, which is a centenary in its own right, because it's a, it's a centenary celebration in a sense, of the 1919 report of the Ministry of Reconstruction after the horrors of the First World War. And that report reached a conclusion that adult education wasn't peripheral, it was a vital national necessity. And that report led to the foundation of a whole kind of structure, echo structure of uh, adult education, which I think profoundly contributed to the development of British social democracy. And it continues because we have had a research circle and the spaces you find where extraordinary things are happening even now. And I have in my mind the memory of a beautiful explanation of in, the, in, the, in the city of Hull in, in the north of England, where a group of Syrians, refugees, were meeting a, a, a group. Uh, and this is adult education at its best. They were working dialogically because it wasn't about teaching the Syrian refugees English. It was about the mutual respect for each other's culture. And the Syrians were encouraged to share their culture. And people I think were genuinely learning from each other. And that kind of respectfulness, I think, created something of a structure of democratic feeling. And I think also what Raymond would say to us now, were he alive, that we have a continuing responsibility in a struggle to create new structures of democratic feeling and learning. In politics, maybe the old masculinist politics won't do anymore. We need a more feminized politics. In unions, in enterprises of various kinds, there are always opportunities available that working with others, we can open up to more dialogical democratic forms of learning relationship in churches, in faith groups, and yes, in universities. Universities may be going one way, maybe more instrumental way, maybe in a, even a more authoritarian, author, authoritarian way, but there are still spaces, including in the classroom, where things are possible, as well as in social, ecological, and political action. Because Raymond would have said to us, be attentive to possibility because that's where resources of hope can be created. Thank you. You are muted, Peter. Okay, people are doing this to me. Uh, okay, I thought it was going poppy. Whatever. <laughs> right. Um, well, thanks. Thanks a lot, Lyndon, for your for your broad presentation, and uh, you managed to put in a lot in a very short time. Um, we should have some discussion now from the rest of the group, and then we move on to the next speaker afterwards. Also, maybe to give people who are who are want to, want to connect more time. I've been doing some phones, some phone calls in between. I just phoned Handel, and I can see him there. Uh, and uh, I don't know about about um, Eugenio. Eugenio, ¿qué tal? Are you there? I don't know. Uh, 
hope he is not giving up the ghost. Anyway, whatever. <clears throat> and uh, one thing uh, which strikes you about, about Raymond Williams, uh, and he claims it's, it's within a British tradition. I, you can trace it back to Shakespeare, actually. The, um, the way the, the, the feeling uncomfortable with the term masses, how masses is used and how you see people as masses defaced, if you like, in this respect. And mm. it, it, yeah, it reminds me, it reminds me actually of, the, of Shakespeare's treatment of the masses, unless this is uh, based on a particular rating of Shakespeare by somebody who has been schooled by Raymond Williams. But you find this in the commentaries, the disdain for the masses and the love of the individual. And uh, I wonder if, if there's, if, 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 two people in different periods um, are being formed part of a British tradition in that, you know, in terms of how to look at masses uh, in this regard. I, I, I see this in, the, in literature, in English literature, particularly through one of its most acclaimed representative, Shakespeare, as being a subject of disdain, of something easily manipulated, which is to contrast with, we had the Freire conference with the other notion of, of not using ma masses, but the collective, where the collective is seen in a positive light, uh, the collective. So you've got the collective a la Freire and many other writers uh, talking about social movements that so you don't liberate yourself on your own, but in concert with others. And then you've got this tradition, which even Adorno speaks to in education after Auschwitz, of that fearsome notion of masses, uh, seen as suspect within the British literary tradition that Raymond Williams speaks to, that Shakespeare is often uh, referred to, and others. I wonder, you know, you want to elaborate on that a bit. I, I would only say, Peter, that um, Raymond was in constant argument with people like Leavis. Oh, and um, and T. S. Eliot even. Um, oh yes, yes, I and, read and, that. And and they they assumed, I think that, that dear, um, the bits of democratization we have and the development of mass society was a disaster for culture. Um, and and Raymond said, yeah. uh, Raymond reacted very strongly about mm -hmm. this, that that any edu extension of education, for instance, was to be um, suspected because it was bringing in those people uh, who hadn't got the means to appreciate, quote, high culture. That wasn't mm. his experience in places like Pandy. Exactly, exactly. And of course, emphatically, it wasn't his experience in workers and adult education, mm -hmm. where ordinary folk were engaging enthusiastically, whether it's with Shakespeare, George Eliot, D. H. Lawrence, or, or, or whatever, and of course it wasn't always uniform. We know, we know that, but that sense of people participating mm -hmm. collectively in the appreciation of a culture and cultural traditions, and actually developing those cultural traditions through that collective activity, I, I think really stands as a as a as, a, as a, 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 an eloquent response, really, to kind of the yeah, Leavises and the Eliots of this world. clear in his chapter on T.S. Eliot, based on two writings by Eliot, not his oeuvre, yeah. in Natural Society, where, yeah. you know, T.S. Eliot, in a very, very elitist sense, uh, yeah. basically says that when you've got a transfer of some cultural products from one group, i.e., call it the, the cultural elite group, to another group, could be working class people, a yeah. group, you will have, and he uses the language that Eliot uses to denounce. Yeah. <coughs> you have a cheapening mm -hmm. consideration. Those are the words. Yeah. It's a the response to, yes, as you said, is no, it is made to relate to a, a, another way of life. Mm. A way of life is definition of culture itself. You know, a different way of life. And I love that for adult, adult education. But I don't take up most time. Uh, I'm sure many people here have comments to make on the three presentations thus far. The one by Sharon, <clears throat> the, the, the recorded 
presentation by Emilio Lucio, connecting with the Spanish context where cultural wars have always been present, because I think the uh, the legacy of the of the um, of the end of the Second Republic, the brutal end of the Second Republic, is still being felt in Spain, and I feel it when I go there. And of course, what you've been saying about <clears throat> in the last presentation by Lyndon West on on various topics, in particular on masses and other forms of ideas connected with the Raymond Williams. So, anybody would like to jump in? That's the question. Carmel, 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 Borge. Yes, a question for... for... <laughs> uh, I suggest that when somebody... We, we... Okay, can I speak? No. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Perhaps a question for uh, Sharon uh, regarding, you know, pedagogy. What would you say is, um, you know, William's major contribution uh, to adult pedagogy, which is, for example, from Freire's, you know, um, uh, contribution to pedagogy? Oh, thanks very much, Carmel. Um, yeah, I mean, I think his major contributions are probably embodied to some degree in cultural studies. Um, I, I was struck by what Lyndon said about <clears throat> the attention to all subjects connecting in a lived experience, in someone's life experience, and their ability to translate that um, through a exchange and dialogue and actually appreciate that various subjects feed in to the pedagogical experience as an adult, because um, as an adult, that kind of um, subject specific focus just doesn't sort of relate in the same way to a, a, an adult life experience. And um, so I think that was a major contribution, but also the notion that, that, that the exchange, the, the pedagogy comes through dialogue. Mm -hmm. It is through discourse, it's through engagement, it's through recognizing someone else as being of equal value and I think that idea of critical thought as well, being able to gently critique people's ideas, as, as Lyndon pointed out, with the, the woman um, with the train coming, disgorging the, uh, the dirty guys, as it were. I think there's a really important point about kind of critical thought processes and someone who's both respectful, but also challenging. So they're for me the, the kind of critical elements that, that Roman Williams brings to adult pedagogy um, and and he did try to articulate that in his ideas of different forms of adult education that I mentioned around dem democratic educator and industrial trainer etc. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. You could say Colin. There's a question by Kurt. He's he's raised his hand. Uh, Kurt, Kurt. I think Colin wants to speak as well Peter. Colin, Colin Kirkwood, yes. Yeah. Is that, okay, is that we'll okay? Take, and then we'll take Kurt. I, have, I can't see Kurt here. I've, Kurt Borch, you want a question? You have a question as well? Okay, go I, ahead, Colin, and then we have Kurt. Okay, right. I, 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 ju I just want to say that thank you to uh, the only two we heard, I heard here myself, Sharon and Lyndon. Uh, um, I think it's perhaps easier for a Scot to say certain things in a context where the reference is really to Wales and England, because <coughs> the real problem I think that we have, which is almost the unspoken thing, the elephant in the room, is this, that the communist tradition and of the East, if you like, and the social democratic tradition of the West and particularly of Britain have too much in common. People derive satisfaction from saying I'm against communism, I'm a social democrat. Well, actually, in many respects, the two traditions are the same. And what they have in common is, is massification and centralization. And the main agent of centralization in the 20th century, uh, not the only one, but the main one, from our point of view, is actually been the Labour Party, whether we like it or not. And that's something that people in England must find it difficult to say, because there's still a tremendous depth of loyalty to the Labour Party. But it was, in fact, it was a Scott, John McIntosh, in The Devolution of Power, which was a, a title that's the biggest lie 
of the 20th century, the devolution of power is really about the centralization, the growing centralization. And it was the Labour Party which conducted that. And, and that falls that's right into the hands of the capitalist system and very similar to the communist system. And it's that we have to break from. And I think Raymond Williams was wanting to break from that, but he was a voice on the sidelines. There wasn't the support within the Labour Party or the Labour movement for that shift from centralization. I'll shut up now. <laughs> That's serious, by the way, and I think that's the central problem. Colin, I would never, ever accuse you of not being serious. <laughs> <laughs> like it, was, it was actually... Uh, and I think Lyndon and... It was, it was Shannon, Colin, actually, actually, who suggested you... Lyndon, it was Colin who actually suggested that I invite... I, uh, suggested you for this conference. <clears throat> well, we're, we're old friends and we've had lots of discussion about these matters. Um, I, I know the, the, the thrust of what you're saying, Colin, and there is a, a tendency in, in social democracy, I think, certainly in the context of parts of the UK anyway, um, that, that the centre knows best. And that um, and it, it's there in the Fabian tradition, it's there in you know some aspects of Labourism. I wouldn't, though, entirely dismiss um, other bits of social democracy. And I think that's represented by people like uh, Richard Henry Tawney, maybe less so in an influential sense that, uh, by, by Raymond Williams, but Tawney had a lot of, a lot of influence. And uh, so, so there's another tradition, uh, I think, but I take your point. I think, um, and I don't, see, I don't see where the Labour Party, if, that, if we talk of that as a social democratic tradition, is going in this regard. I think it's in a state of, it's like it's, 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 it's stuck in the front of headlights, blinded and trying to work out what the hell to do. Yeah. I think I have to say though, Colin, to be slightly mischievous, that if we think of the Scottish Nationalist Party as a bit mm. of a social democratic beast, it too loves its centralism. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That's true. That's true. I agree. Mm. <laughs> I think the whole political machine throughout yeah. the United Kingdom is absolutely dazzled and beaten by centralism. The SNP is just as bad as the Labour Party. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. Kurt, do you have a question? Um, yes, yes, I do. Um, uh, first of all, a recent member, new member of my old department and the faculty. Um, anyway. Yeah, go ahead, Kate. Right. Um, first of all, thank you to all speakers for, for your talks. I have a question for Lyndon. Um, I'm aware that, that you are a psychoanalyst by, by, by training as well. And my question actually is about the notion of the structure of feeling and how you look at it from a psychoanalytic point of view, insofar as what can we say about... Uh, my, my question ties on to your last... Um, point in, the, in your last slide on making resources of hope practical and despair unconvincing. Yeah. So really my question is about what is the place for hope and despair in, in leftist activism theory and practice? And what can we say about the left's affective, affective um, emotional investment in hope? Is it a discourse that keeps on being banded about as a, as a kind of fantasy in the Lacanian sense perhaps? Um, uh, because um, le leftist critique is so excellent at articulating and diagnosing what's wrong with the world, and we've all read tons of books about that. Um, at best, the left is able to articulate what, what perhaps we can hope for, um, but is this hope a kind of ambiguous thing that we posit in an undefined um, future? Um, uh, or is this despair, this leftist despair, something that some people can afford more than others? I say this because I've been following three, these last three days, this um, Paulo Freire um, oh. mm. symposium. And uh, the more precarious the context being described, and I was also reading Peter's latest book on um, the MST in Brazil and so on. And 
I was finding hope and resistance more in these places rather than the more democratic spaces of, of, of you know, American and English academia. Um, so this despair is, is somewhat hypocritical when really uttered in, 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 in these comfortable places. I don't know. Um, well, thank you, Kurt. I mean, I, I didn't say it because there wasn't time, but I mean, I have had a conversation in my head and in my heart in my imagination with Raymond about, broadly speaking, psychoanalysis. I mean, he thought Freud was far too individualistic. Um, but at the same time, I think Mike, Mike Rustin, whose work you may know, has, has made this comment that object relations gives us another psychoanalytic object relations in, in the traditions of people like Donald Winnicott gives us another take, take on this. So. I think when I've looked at um, some of the historical, but also at the evidence of my work in, in, in you know, a kind of very marginalized, deindustrialized community, and um, I've kind of reflected with learners on what makes a real difference. I think the object relations tradition switches the frame slightly. So we go from a kind of slightly solipsistic internal world to a relational world. And I think that um, if we imagine people whose internal world is perhaps people by uh, those who may be quite dismissive of them, if you enter into a different quality of space, and this is something that doesn't happen immediately, it may take a long time. But if you have a, somebody in an authority position, and we can imagine here someone like Raymond Williams or Richard Henry uh, Tawney, and if you're struggling to try to say something and you feel you're stupid and have nothing to say, but then you get a response. And these things aren't necessarily conscious, but they're, they're very intimate actually in a certain sort of way. A response which says, well, it's very interesting. I value what you do. And I've listened to students' testimony and they've said afterwards or subsequently, that moment was magical for them because mm. then they felt the foot for the first time they could actually be in a group, an adult education group or even a university group where they felt that they could be of, of value. So the point I'm making here is that not only have we got the notion of an intersubjective relationship, but over time, and this is the object relations dimension, those, those voices are internalized. So if we think of psyche as a kind of theater, you know, with a cast of characters, you're getting different characters entering the stage. And those characters might be someone like Richard Henry Tawney or Raymond Williams, but they might be other students who you begin to feel part of a group, part of a valuable community, you feel recognized, and this is Axel Honneth's phrase, which I make quite a lot of use of in relation to some of these issues alongside, you know, psychoanalytic thought, this sense of feeling recognized. And when you feel recognized, and that percolates through into the psyche, you can then begin to better recognize others. And that's, I think, the connection with the democratic structure of feeling. It's that process of feeling sufficiently in a good enough way recognized yourself. And then you can, in a good enough way, begin to recognize others more fully. Okay, um, and let's have a final question and then we move to Ian Mentor. Um, um, okay, <clears throat> anybody else? Rav, Rav. Yeah, if I, if I may, Peter, thank you. Sure. Um, I'd, I'd be really interested in continuing this question around centralization. I think this is actually a really interesting question, particularly the experience that uh, Europe writ large is going through at the moment. And I'd like to ask sort of a speculative question, I suppose, which is um, what do people who have worked and lived with William's thought believe would be his analysis of the various fractures and pressures that we're seeing across Europe at the moment because he was a pro-European but I don't imagine the current state of the EU is what he had in <coughs> mind when he positioned himself as a pro-European so I'd be really interested to hear how people feel about um, various aspects of it the migrant crisis the blooming b-word um, you know the various uh, the rise of the right in in sort of really unexpected places including France and um 
what do you think Williams would have made of this and how would he have seen it from his perspective? I'd love to hear thoughts on that if people would be willing. Mm -hmm. No thoughts. Oh, I've got lots of thoughts, but I, bet you have <laughs> I don't want to be speaking. Sharon, have you got a. Yeah. I'm just thinking about it to be honest Linda so yeah you you pitch in if you can or you want to <laughs> no I'd, I'd like to hear I mean it's getting a bit me-centered and that's not good inclusive dialogical education I, I'd like to bring in others go on Sharon go for it <laughs> <laughs> it's a difficult one isn't it I mean I I I, I think that I I was thinking about centralization earlier and I think he saw such um such generosity in community, local um, interpretations of power and knowledge and understanding and respect. That, that's how I interpret his notion of decentralization. And that's incredibly far and removed from what we have at the moment. So my interpretation of his decentralization concept is, is perhaps much more about a sense of not not little England, not small community, but a sense of collegiality and community with people with whom you engage and communicate. And I, and I think that's missing from PISA, it's missing from all the kind of the big data that we're all obsessed with. It's missing from understandings of governance around education. Um, and and it's, it's actually deeply disconnected from lived experience. And so that would probably be my main contribution around that. I, that is how I interpret his, his my feeling about his in understanding of decentralization, what it really ought to mean. <laughs> am, am I allowed to speak again? Nobody's going to stop yeah, you. Come on. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's an open agora. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, I think this is a really difficult question because I, I feel very much in tune with Raymond Williams' attitude to local communities, to persons and their relations. I really do. But I think we now have a problem in the world as a whole that the entire culture of all the politics and of the globe, all the politics and societies of the globe has gone toward huge over-centralization. That's the reality. So to come out and say, oh, we want decentralization, it's a bit like saying we don't like all this, we want anarchy instead. And immediately anarchy is always denounced uh, as destructive. So we have to find a way of building a big bridge between the reality of huge centralization across the globe and the fact that no human beings live at the point where centralization and center is. There's a huge gap between the person and centralized culture, centralized authority. And centralized culture is not only in, in, uh, in uh, education, but also and not only in politics, but also in the media. Media is massively centralized in every single country now. It's very difficult for to identify a space where ordinary people can feel at one with each other and have community with each other. And if I can just throw another little minor bomb into it, I'm very uncomfortable with the resumption on the left of the use of the word collective. And the reason I never used it, have used it, and I don't use it, is because I had read, before I started my life in politics and education, I had read all the stuff about the Soviet Union. We knew what was going on in the Soviet Union. Mm. It was collectivism gone mad. Mm. Stalin could kill as many people as he wanted. That's collectivism. I don't use the word. I think that if you read, for example, Paulo Freire's great work, the pedagogy of the oppressed, you will not find the word collectivism in it at all. Now, I, I can't actually prove that because I didn't go through it page, page by page. Why have we turned to this word collectivism again? I prefer persons in relation. Yeah. We have to reinvent a combination of good mm -hmm. central leadership with mm -hmm. persons in relation at every level. I shall mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that, that's a lovely phrase of yours, Colin, which I really like, persons in relationship. And I think it does 
connect yeah. or connect the intimate with with the, the the more social i just want to say a couple i don't have any easy answers to this um raymond i think would have been horrified at what's happening in europe um i think he might have been ambivalent about the european project the way it was developing but i think he would have probably he would have had the imagination to realize what the consequence of brexit would be and the consequence mm. of brexit the consequence of brexit was much more important in terms of a european project which still remains very very fragile mm. and we see now the knock-on effect in various countries particularly in the east and i think in those terms given european history it's not been a good idea the other point i'd make is that um there's been hollowing out here uh, i i think we need some kind of center i do actually believe that but at the same time the 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 structures of possibility that for so long existed, certainly in English society, maybe Welsh, Scottish, I don't know, but certainly in English society, as exemplified in traditions of municipal socialism, for instance, mm. which I think supported once upon a time, all kinds of uh, initiatives. Those traditions post 1979 have been hollowed out. And yeah. the neoliberal project has been quite specific about that. Mm -hmm. So the, it's and also part of it, I think, has been related to that the, the 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 weakening of civil society. You go to a place like Stoke, where I come from, and there once was a very vibrant civil society yeah. in the churches. I have to stress that not just the nonconformist churches in trade unions, yeah. in political activity of a variety of kinds um in in the cooperative movement and that largely has disintegrated so that the 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 the, the spaces that might once have been available <clears throat> that could act as a counterbalancing power to an over mighty center have largely gone and part of the responsibility for that must be the neo liberal yeah, project of faith Yes. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not a bit conscious of the time, although I do suspect we're going to have one speaker less um, because he hasn't uh, shown himself up. Uh, shown him. Shown uh, his name has not appeared yet on the screen. Um, let's move on on to the next speaker, who is Professor Ian Mentor, who is um, an emeritus professor from the University of Oxford, and I've just heard that he um, he's got a book in press right now. On Williams and education, and he's going to speak to the title of that book, right? Yeah, that's right. Thank you. All right, over to you. Well, many thanks to Peter for this invitation to take part and present in this event. I think what I have to say will extend beyond the field of adult education, which is the central interest for many of you, and one of the reasons, of course, that Williams is such an important figure for all of us. So in this talk, I'm drawing on my book, which will be published next month by Bloomsbury Press. And in particular, I want to draw on the introduction and conclusion to the book to try and demonstrate why Williams is such an important thinker in the broader field of education. And that's the only slide I've got, actually. I'm going to talk uh, from a right. written script, if that's all right with everybody. It'll make a change from the lovely PowerPoints we've been seeing in earlier presentations. So I want to start with a quotation from Culture and Society. Quote, this is Raymond. I wish first that we should recognize that education is ordinary, that it is before everything else the process of giving to the ordinary members of society its full common meanings and the skills that will enable them to amend these meanings in the light of their personal and common experience. So education, like culture, is ordinary. It is part of the human lived experience. That is my starting point. Although in his academic work, he's best known for his literary criticism and cultural theory, there's a great deal in his writing as well as in his political life that shines a brilliant and original light on many aspects of education. And that's the distinctive focus of my book. I would suggest a relatively small number of education scholars have recognized his significance 
in the wider field of education studies. It's well recognized within adult education, but I think beyond that, it's not so well recognized. And I don't think there's been a concerted attempt to pull together the insights that can be drawn from his life and from his published work that help us to understand the nature of education in contemporary society. That's the ambition of my book. And in adding three terms to its title, history, culture, democracy, I'm seeking to draw attention to three particular dimensions that are crucial to our understanding of how Williams developed his own understanding of education. Raymond Williams was totally committed to the importance of a historical lens in making sense of contemporary phenomena. It's only through following trajectories of development that it's possible to appreciate why social relations, institutions, and life experiences are as they are. That's history. As for culture, Williams famously asserted, as we've heard already, that culture is ordinary, which was a way of reminding us that our ways of life shape all of our experience. Indeed, this is no longer seen as a radical idea, it's now taken, often taken for granted in public discourse, but this was far from the case in the 1950s and 1960s. <clears throat> and as for democracy, Williams was committed to a strongly community-based form of politics with self-organization at its center. Although being firmly of the left, indeed of the new left as it became known, and although he was the lead editor of the May Day Manifesto, his own political persuasion argued for what he memorably called, and we've heard this earlier, a long revolution, a steady move towards full participation and greater equality in society. A key element of this long revolution lay in education. Education both as a set of institutions and as a process of learning and development. There are several elements to supporting my case that Williams' contribution to education is highly significant. And I'm just going to suggest four of them now. First, the simple point that he was a teacher through and through. His whole life was about engaging intellectually with others, seeing knowledge and understanding as key elements in the realization of humanity. Always challenging inequality and oppression. He recognized that knowledge was and is powerful and in all of his engagements, whether in politics or in letters, he strove to deepen his own and others understanding, always with a deep degree of integrity and respect. Vitriolic though academia and politics can be, and whilst not afraid to engage in sometimes quite heated debates, Williams always sought to apply reason and provide evidence for the case he was making at the time. This rationality was combined with enormous creativity, deeply inspiring to those who heard him or read his work. These are some of the qualities of teaching of the teacher that are deep within the spirit of education for democracy. That's the first point. Secondly, he did directly address questions of educational provision. His analysis of the development of schooling in England, most explicitly in the Long Revolution, exposed the deep contradictions in the provision of a so-called universal education that was actually deeply divided, not least along lines of social class. His own biography, particularly as one of the few working class grammar school boys to make it to Cambridge, one of the most elite universities in the world, only served to reinforce this analysis. But as well as arguing the case for inclusive, common or comprehensive schooling, he also argued forcefully for the protection and promotion of the humanities and social sciences within higher education at a time when policymakers were emphasizing the importance of science and technology. And of course, Williams did not demur from agreeing these areas of study were also crucial. His passionate commitment to adult education also derived from his experience and values. He saw such provision as, essentially, as essential in supporting intellectual development within the wider community, especially for those who had not had decent educational opportunities 
earlier in their lives. Thirdly, through the development of the methods of what became known as cultural materialism, Williams provided a range of analytical tools and critical concepts that can be deployed in the analysis of educational structures, policies, and processes. His careful development of a nuanced view of the relation between economy and society and the placing of education as a key element in this relation continues to be valuable. Although deeply influenced by Marxist ideas, he was one of the most original, thoughtful, and particular users of these theories in insisting that cultural matters, including education, were as much, much a matter for concern in challenging inequalities in society as were questions about the ownership of capital or the means of production. And fourthly, in his analyses of literature, drama, film, and television, he was a key founder of what is now referred to as cultural studies or media studies, a point Sharon made earlier. He brought some of the insights from anthropology, sociology, and literary criticism into an original combination that showed new connections between cultural activity and social life. The realization that these creative forms have social and political power has been perhaps been present in our understanding for many years, but the distinctive way of bringing these disciplines to bear and to connect them was at that time radical, and indeed met much initial opposition from conservative forces, both within the academy and within the political establishment. These four themes are explored more fully in my book. Now, as has been alluded to already, Raymond Williams developed two parallel writing careers which stayed with him throughout his life. The one for which he is best known is his work on literary criticism and cultural theory. Over his lifetime, he published important and original works on film, on drama, on fiction, and perhaps most distinctively on the relations between English literature and society. However, in William's deep commitment to the power of fiction to provide insight to human life and social relations, he himself was also a novelist. In many ways, he saw this second strand as his most important writing. His Welsh trilogy started with Border Country, which Lyndon was talking about, first published in 1960. And this includes some insights into his own experience of school, which I discuss in my book. But turning now to his political and sociological analysis of education as a public institution, Williams provided a seminal account of the development of education in Britain, but especially England, in the Long Revolution. Education is seen as one of the key planks of the steady move towards an egalitarian and democratic society, which Williams believed was emerging in Britain. He placed education alongside other cultural institutions, such as the press and public libraries, as providing one of the mechanisms for ensuring that all citizens should, could become politically empowered to play a part in the development of a democratic society. Tracing the history of English education from the 17th through to the 20th century, he shows how competing forces have shaped the nature of the school curriculum, or we should say curricula when schooling is itself divided into different types of institution. This analysis clearly demonstrates how a full understanding of contemporary education must be based on tracing developments through history. The ways in which Williams connects wider social developments with the emergence of those public institutions providing education is extraordinarily rich and subtle. Throughout this and discussions elsewhere in his work, we see a great tension arising between his view of education as coming from the wider social environment that is part of becoming and the necessarily selective curriculum offered within formal schooling and higher education. Of course, there will be tensions within the processes of selection leading to what is frequently a curriculum differentiated in alignment with social divisions. Indeed, the very provision of schooling may be socially differentiated even within the public sector. 
the tripartite secondary schooling of state education in England in the post-war era was something to which Williams was strongly opposed, joining calls for a unified or common approach to schooling, as well as the development of a common core curriculum. And it was his deep awareness of historical social divisions that enabled him to enter, identify those three key ideologies, which Sharon referred to in reference to adult education, but he also applies them to the whole of school education, the struggles in England between the old humanists, the industrial trainers, and the public educators. We have seen ways in which tensions between these three forces continue to be played out to this day. Furthermore, while Williams developed this framework from his analysis of education in Britain or England, the same forces can be seen to have been active in the USA and in all Western democracies, or the balance, although the balance between them is often different. For example, with the old humanists being more visible in European contexts than in North American. These struggles are now sometimes uh, grouped under the bracket of culture wars and can be detected in higher education as well as in schooling. For Williams though, overarching these policy debates and contestation about the structures and content of formal education, whether in schools or in universities, is the concern to stimulate and develop what was referred to as popular education through both formal and informal approaches. From his immersion in and very significant contribution to adult education during the first part of his own career, we can see how significant for Williams was the provision of educational opportunities for older people. In a society where so many young people had not had opportunities to fulfill their educational potential while at school, it was crucial to the development of a democratic society and culture that there should be opportunities for them in later life, and that these should be of the highest quality and offer access to the full range of culture, including the literary canon in which William's own higher education was steeped. While all these forms of educational provision, schooling, higher education, adult education were important, Williams's insights also crucially drew attention to the wider aspects of the process of education through popular media, indeed popular culture. The influence of printed newspapers may have diminished since his time, but still there, not least as these organizations have developed their online platforms. The commercial base of much of the news and media sectors persists. Advertising is an integral part, not just of television and news platforms, but also of communication networks such as those provided by Google, Twitter, and Facebook. The shaping of people's knowledge and understanding of the world in which they live, their education in the broadest sense, is profoundly shaped by these forms of communication. Another element that has developed significantly since William's time is what has been called globalization, the term primarily used to refer to the increasing flow of international trade and communication. This too has been greatly accelerated through the development of digital media, as well as relatively cheap air travel, up until a recent point. The mobile privatization that Williams identified in Britain as a phenomenon in the second half of the 20th century has in some ways become a worldwide phenomenon in the 21st century. Or at least that was the case prior to the coronavirus pandemic, which struck in 2020. Its rapid spread itself a, uh, a feature of contemporary globalization. The internationalization of many forms of popular culture, including film, television, and music, have drastically changed worldwide awareness of cultural diversity, but also paradoxically, paradoxically have simultaneously led to increasing cultural convergence, even a kind of homogenization. These developments in culture and in international communication provide yet more powerful reasons for emphasizing the significance of well-designed, open and inclusive educational provision in order to promote the kinds of freedoms to which societies around the world aspire. 
the provision needs to be designed according to the currently appropriate balance between the cultural, economic, and democratizing purposes that Williams identified in his historical analysis. Education needs to be concerned with helping the learner to understand society and his or her own place within it, and with providing the intellectual tools and political skills to exercise meaningful agency individually and collectively within that society. Towards the end of my book, I review Th Williams's theoretical legacy and its relevance to the study of education, as well as discussing structures of feeling mentioned by Lyndon, I reflect on what is understood today by cultural materialism and consider its contemporary relevance and usefulness. Drawing on his influential paper, Base and Superstructure in Marxist Cultural Theory, I consider how his ideas connect with those of social and educational theorists and sociologists such as Basil Bernstein and Pierre Bourdieu. I suggest that Williams's ideas provide immensely powerful tools for making sense of the increasingly competitive, managerialist, networked, and conflicted world of educational policymaking in the contemporary social landscape. The final chapter of my book revisits key themes that have been discussed earlier on, not least those of history, culture, and democracy, in order to summarize Williams's significant but often undervalued contribution to education studies. In this reappraisal, some weaknesses in his stance that others have identified, for example, in relation to issues of gender and race are discussed. But the message with which the book finishes is one of hope for the future, hope for the power of education indeed to offer in the title of another of his collections of essays, Resources of Hope. In the final section of Towards 2000, subtitled Resources for a Journey of Hope, being referred to already, Williams again emphasizes the importance of human action and agency. On the downside, he says, quote, first, the objective changes which are now so rapidly developing are not only confusing and bewildering, they are also profoundly unsettling. The ways now being offered to live with these unprecedented dangers and these increasingly harsh dislocations are having many short-term successes and effects, but they are also in the long-term term, forms of further danger and dislocation. Of course, Towards 2000 published in 1983, so we're beginning to see the impact of what was happening under the Thatcher government. But then he goes on to say, quote, Secondly, there are very strong reasons why we should challenge what now most controls and constrains us. The idea of such a world as an inevitable future. It is not some unavoidable real world with its laws of economy and laws of war that is now blocking this. It is a set of identifiable processes of real politic and force majeure, of nameable agencies of power and capital distraction and disinformation, and all these interlocking with the embedded short-term pressures and the interwoven subordinations of an adaptive common sense. This was a far-seeing vision, realized now through the creation of our post-truth mediatized culture of the 21st century. He concludes towards 2000 with this call for a positive change, quote, if there are no easy answers, there are still available and discoverable hard answers, and it is these that we can now learn to make and share. This has been, from the beginning, the sense and impulse of the long revolution." Unquote. In my book, written 100 years after he was born, I have sought to explore and amplify Williams's demonstration of the crucial relationships between education, policy and practices on the one hand, and the study and creation of culture and democracy on the other. Williams himself was always a teacher, what you might call a relentless and tireless pedagogue. The three words used as the underpinning of this book, history, cultural, democracy, have been demonstrated to be fundamental to our deployment 
of William's ideas in the study of education. I wish to conclude, as I started, by reminding us that it was not only Williams's ideas that were and are important, it was also his teaching. The commitments to socialism and to education were something he undoubtedly shared with another great pedagogue, although I don't think they ever met, born in the same year as Williams, Paolo Freire, whose life, of course, has also been celebrated this week in another fest. As for Freire, so with Williams. While for many people Williams's teaching comes through in his writing, there can be little argument that his whole career and life's work may be seen as a pedagogical mission. In politics and in letters, he was on a ceaseless, passionate quest to inquire, to learn and to teach. In that sense, for everyone who sees themselves in any way as an educator, his efforts and achievements provide a lasting inspiration. For those of us living, teaching and learning in the 21st century, we need to take into account much that has changed. Most notably, these features would be the wider realization of environmental threat to the planet, the continuing indeed, continuation, indeed, escalation <coughs> of inequalities and injustice, and the threats to new forms of populism in democratic politics. But it would be Raymond Williams's contention, and this is the message I hope is conveyed in my book, that education, in his words, permanent education is an essential part of addressing the future and securing safety, stability, security, justice and equity for the citizens of the globe. I will finish with another Williams quotation taken from Communications, the book that was derived from his involvement in a teacher's conference in the early 1960s. Quote, what I have said about growth can be related to the idea of permanent education. This idea seems to me to repeat in new and important idiom, the concepts of learning and of popular democratic culture. What it valuably stresses is the educational force of our whole social and cultural experience. It is therefore concerned not only with continuing education of a formal or informal kind, but with what the whole environment, its institutions and relationships actively and profoundly teaches. Thanks very Thank much you. for listening. Um, <clears throat> okay, am I muted? No, I'm not. Thank you very much um, for this lengthy overview of your forthcoming book, which we I, I hope to read. Hope it will be in paperback. Not initially, I'm afraid. It's going to be a okay, big, yeah. big trust, outlay. Trust, Get your library Bloom to buy it. Yeah, trust Bloomsbury for that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, publishing houses. We should actually go local. We should go <laughs> online. But anyway, um, yeah, I mean, so many, so many, so many teams. Uh, it's a very difficult thing being the organizer and also cheer, cheering and having to comment because my, my ears on the phone trying to trace people I haven't heard from and some have come in now so i'm quite grateful that eugenio is is connected now because it's his turn to speak um we can have a discussion after after this um but you you know you touched many many many, many points in williams uh, um, starting off with williams being an educator first and foremost a teacher first and foremost this is a guy who who was a committed socialist, who also intervened in war efforts on the point of principle. So he it was a tank commander in the Second World War where he, when, when he interrupted his studies at Cambridge uh, to, to, to fight and uh, take part in the landing at Normandy because it was a war against fascism and, Naz and Nazism. But he, he refused on the case of uh, objective conscience, conscience, objective conscience, to participate in the Korean War, for instance. So he, you know, even his interventions in the war were also motivated by his own principles, et cetera. Anyway, this is probably one aspect of Williams which has not been mentioned in, but it is an important part as well. Um, I saw one of the photos earlier on, 
He was also very active in the in the CND, um, the nuclear disarmament um, movement, together with E.P. Thompson and others. And of course, um, um, anyway, um, at my age now, I, I, I start forgetting what I was going to say. But anyway, you probably some of you might might uh, share that feeling too. But anyway, um, I'm I'm very happy to see Eugenio Cortez Ramirez's uh, name there because I know he has a lot to say about Raymond Williams. Uh, Are we going to have a comfort break at all? Pardon? Are we going to have a comfort break at all? Okay. Uh, how how do you feel about that? Do you want to have... just just a minute anyway or two? Oh, let's have let's have a ten minute break. I have a cup of tea. Come back. Yeah, good. Thank right. you. Okay, yeah. and this will give also Eugenia time to settle down and handle, and then we will conclude the seminar. Now we have a few general questions for the last uh, for the for the speakers that we had, and also speakers in general. Eugenio, okay, I can see you. So we have the the full international mix. See you. Okay. See you in ten minutes.
Okay, are we are we all back here? Ah, uh, I'm not sure whether whether the ten minutes are up, but anyway, I think we should proceed. Okay, um, our our next speaker is um, is a good friend from Spain, from the University of Castilla La Mancha based at Cuenca, Eugenio Enrique Cortes Ramirez, uh, who is very passionate about Raymond Williams and the cultural studies traditions. And um, the floor is yours, uh, um, Eugenio. Okay. Well, many thanks, Peter, for your introduction. I... Can you hear me? Can you hear <clears throat> me? Yes, perfectly. Okay. I will share the, the screen with all of you. Mm -hmm. Let me take it here. Let me take it here. Let's see. How can I show? Okay, let me try. That's the one. It's the bottom. Um menu with the green icon thank you okay you like button the menu yes sure mm -hmm. let me check it mm -hmm. then you must choose your powerpoint presentation i know You're on mute, Eugenio. You've muted. Okay, can you can you hear it? Can you see it? No, no. Not really. Oh. When you press the share screen, the green share screen icon, a window will appear with your PowerPoint. Let me check it. <clears throat> wow. And you must press the smaller window, which appears, mm -hmm. smaller windows with the PowerPoint presentation. Oh, I know. Okay, well, no problem. Well, uh, okay, well, so we'll try to, can you, can you see it now? No, not really. Okay. Well, otherwise, I, try, I will try to to talk about this this speech. Okay, about this uh, subject on Raymond Williams um, <clears throat> Williams's theory of culture. Okay. Well, we'll do that. Well, <clears throat> this will be a, a cultural rhetoric approach to this to his theory of culture. Well, everybody knows that Raymond Williams was a young man, and he was a son of a, road, a railroad man who managed to start at Cambridge to develop or the strong social conscience, becoming a, a, becoming a focused intellectual pioneer in the areas of philosophy and literature. He was also the central figure of the new left movement. <clears throat> comprised between 1960 and 1970 in England, and his position was marked by his struggle against elitism of British conservatism and dogmatism and reductionism, reductionism of the Stalinist left. As a contributor to the New Left Review publication, what his main vehicles for the dissemination of the ideas of the New Left, he was also one of the promoters of the so-called Birmingham Circle, from where he promoted the studies of the theory of literature and cultural studies. 
especially oriented to study the culture. See if I can show you the, the PowerPoint again. Let me see. I don't know what's happening. Okay. Okay, now no. let's see. Now uh, we were saying okay, well, can you can you see it now no. again? No? No. 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 no, so sorry. Well, no. <clears throat> I wish that no. uh, well, could well, he well, send sorry. it to you yes, by yeah. email yeah, sure. and then you oh. can yeah, sure, sure. I will do that. I will do that. I will send it to you by email, no problem. No. To Joseph Van Sale. To to Peter, I will send it to Peter. No, no, okay. come in. no to Joe Van Sale. Joseph Van Sale. Joseph Van Sale. Okay, no problem. No problem. I will do that now immediately. Joseph Van Joseph Van Okay. Okay, now. Have you sent it? I am. I have it. Yes. No, nothing. Can you can you see it? No, I haven't received it yet. Yes, sure, sorry. And send it again. A PowerPoint. I'm sorry. Yes, no, I don't know. It's on the in the tank. Oh, I will do that. Okay, again. One solid. Okay, now. Now it's flying now. Have you got the Joseph? No, no, I haven't received it. Joseph dot Vancel at um yes, 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 no, no. dot mt. I know, I know, I know, I know. This is now flying. No, I, th I think it's yourself now. Yourself. Um, Just take okay. some time to. Have you got it? No. No. Joseph Bonsell, let me send it. Joseph Bonsell, this is. Um... You got it, Joe. Oh, okay, okay, it's uh, now. Have you got it? Yep. Yes. Okay, well, thank you. Just well. give me a second. Um, Okay, it's all yours. All right, there he is. 
Okay, you got it. Tell me to go yes. to the next slide. Well, let me, well, let me check it now. Well, let me remind Okay. I will do that now. Well, I wish that before. Okay. Now we'll start again or we'll follow. Do I have the command to to move this? Okay, well, it's a, like like a brief introduction. We could say this. Uh, um, let me check it. Let me check it now. Well, when you tell me, I'll just. Um, okay. Well. Could you well, I will I will do it with you because I have another okay. another hardware here. Between one here as well. So okay, no problem. I will do that. I will follow. Yes. So. Okay. Okay, Joseph, can you can you start now? Mm, sure. I, I will. Can, I can. Okay, well, as I said before, the, change the um. That's uh, right. So what technical issue? When you tell yeah. me, I just change the slide. Should I okay, move? Well, we said yes. We said before that uh, he was a too angry young man. Okay. We, uh, can you can you make a move to the to the first one? Second slide, Joe. Yes, of course. Okay, now we could say that uh, Raymond Williams was a true angry young man. He would say, we would say, uh, I, I had said that he was a son of a railway, a railway man who managed to study Cambridge, to develop a strong conscience, social conscience. He was a pioneer focused on the areas of lived philosophy and literature. Please, next one. Um, mm -hmm. The other one. Yes, uh, well, let me check it first. Please, okay, next central one. figure, right? No problem. No problem. No one sec, one sec. Yes. Uh, Should I move or? Yes, yeah, sure, please. Make me move it, please. Okay, thank you. Let it, uh, let it here. No. So we have Richard Hogger. Yeah. Okay, okay, no. Okay, well. Before, uh, before this, uh, check it here. Before, before this. Should I move the slide or? Please. Please uh, try try to to move it. Let me check. What about from the beginning? From the beginning. From the beginning. Yes. Peter oh. Mayer. Okay. Okay, we've got the fr the front one. Oh. You got it. Yes. So it was. Mm. Oh. One sec. Well, you have the front one. Okay. Now, yes, which we could say this. Okay. Well, what we said before, we were saying that uh, that uh, he, he was a contributor to the. Uh, could you uh, could you move to the second slide? 
As a contributor to the new Left Review Week publication, one of his main vehicles for the dissemination of the ideas of the new Left was also one of the promoters of the so-called Birmingham Circle, from where he promoted the studies of theory of literature and cultural studies. Please, next one. Next one. Especially oriented to the study of popular culture. Next one, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. At the yes. As the, at the time, in European history, according to Williams and also to his friend, a phenomenon of massification of culture was beginning to take place. This view was also shared by his most immediate predecessor, Richard Herbert Hogarth. In his work, The Uses of Literacy, Hogarth stated that we are entering a mass culture configured by remnants of what was once a true an urban culture of the people, and that, was, and that is being destroyed. In fact, Hogarth's attack was not against popular culture, but was but against mass culture. Regarding the definition of culture, in this way, for Williams, England was at the end of the, double, uh, the World War II, undermined by the bankruptcy of the old class culture. There was <clears throat> a loss of tightly night communities that were replaced by the emerging mass culture dominated by tabloids, advertisements, and Hollywood stories. This alien phenomena had colonized local communities and removed their, their distinctive features. Popular, um, popular culture, however, was created, had integrity and was developed according to its own laws and not as an object that was manipulated by the mass media. It reflected what Gramsci, a huge influence of Williams, a later exponent of cultural studies such as Stuart Hall, called as the popular creative spirit. According to, to, to Williams, culture helps maintain political order in modern society. The impulses toward action helps the desire to avoid human efforts, human efforts and errors, to clean up confusion and mitigate misery. The aspiration for the better and happy world that the one that exists comes from the foundations of culture is the in the engine for these impulses that has the task not for or scientific knowledge but of morality and correspond to the patient to do good uh, having culture is knowing the best that has been written and thought about the world according to williams when the term culture had the broader meaning more inclusive of all productions and processes within a given society it was not simply restricted to most of the cultural manifestations of the elites. Yes. The idea of high culture refers to those aspects of culture that are mainly valued by an intellectual, political, social, economic elite. So in general, the most powerful members of society are the only ones who have real influence on sense-oriented cultural systems. And thus, the most powerful classes tend to enjoy the privilege of defining their own lifestyle as high culture. Popularity is not necessarily fame and great diffusion such as the highest engrossing series and movies or the televisions or radio programs with the highest ratings. All societies have their own objectives and purposes and mechanisms to produce meanings. All societies express their meanings in institutions and in the arts and school and non-formal education. The production of the society consists of finding common meanings and directions and its development derives from a debate and a constant adjustment of the demand experience. Content average. Culture comprises this, this sense, a total way of life that entails the common meanings the arts and education, the special processes of discovery and creative endeavors. Um, <clears throat> Williams' a proposal of theory of culture appears mainly in two of his works, namely Culture and Society, 1780 uh, 1950, published in 1958, and The Love Revolution, published in 1961. In the former, 
Williams offers a critical panorama from Romanticism to Orwell. He defines the literary as a cultural process that should not be understood through its adaptation and mechanisms of incorporation. He reviews the study of the critique of culture in parallel way to that carried out by F.R. Lewis in his book, The Great Tradition, published in 1948. William makes clear that the modern use of the word culture has appeared in the Industrial Revolution period together with other terms that are part of the common source jargon, such as art and industry, in tension with industrialism. Culture is presented as a process within the semantic alteration that are linked to social, political, and economic changes, and not simply as the highest products of society as expressed in the great works of individual genius. It reflects a whole way of life, which can provide different readings of text according to these ways of life, including that of the subaltern with a cheapening or adultery in the work. I question as a response to T.S. Eliot. In the long revolution, William analyzes the history of cultural forms and institutions in Great Britain over the past 200 years. Moreover, he develops a theoretical framework whereby one can explore this process of dynamic change by means of some notions such as the structure of feeling, dominant culture, residual culture and emerging cultures than emerge and emergence of the dominant and opposition forms. Williams characterizes the experience of quality of life within a spatial temporal configuration that is operating in the most delicate and least tangible part of our activities. Besides, he evokes a common set of perception and values shared by a generation that is articulated in artistic forms and conventions. In addition, William retains the complex relationship between differentiated being feeling structures and differentiated classes. It is a tension between ideology and experience. In his book, Marxism and Literature, published in 1977, following Gramsci, Ryan Williams reacts the reductionism of a certain orthodox vulgar Marxist image to highlight the relative autonomy of the superstructure of the cultural dimension. William Excuse rejects, me, you need to move the slide forward. Next yes, slide. please. William rejects okay. the Marxist position for different reasons. Next one. Next one, please. Thank it's you. Okay. If reduced the superstructure to a mere reflection, if abstracts culture from the historical process, it depicts human needs as mere economic and no social needs. It marginalizes the culture within the economic organization. For Williams, the practices are social and contain both material and symbolic elements. Moreover, William points more, out more the importance forward, of the material deal. component. Next one, next one, please. Next one. <clears throat> with the symbolic belonging belonging to the base of material life and social experience and therefore having strong presence within social and productive relationship next one joseph please <clears throat> next slide please thank you <clears throat> so in 1962 he also published communication a highly next one please joseph. next, next, next slide. a highly influential study among communication Researchers in the UK in the early 60s, his polemics on the meaning of television were recorded in Television, Technology and Cultural Forms, 19, published in 1974, where he synthesizes his contribution as a media <coughs> This work is the fundamental example of the application of cultural materialism to historical analysis. The main features of these works are, on the one hand, an original reflection that associates his class extraction, a militancy, and his sensitivity to the cultural transformation of the United Kingdom. On the other, there are also educational commitments, links in the working class and proximity to the movement on the new left and the Labour Party. Next That's one, please. Nice. Next one. The category, the categories of class, culture, industry, arts, art, 
reflects William's contention that literature is far from being a low a solely aesthetic device. His aim is to highlight its cultural, political, and social dimension. This is an important decentralization. The uh, decentralization regarding the concept of literature and the literary for Williams, so sociological culture or cultural hist historical studies are social practices and relationships. Or relationships producing culture or ideology more significantly. Their in inherent dynamics provide continuity and the discriminations, tensions, conflicts, the resolution, innovations, and changes. Next one, from please. There is also a possibility. I mean, could you make a new new slide? There is also a possibility to make general differentiation between different periods of history based on different modes of production. The dominant formations are too broad, too, uh, too broad and need to be divided at different times. Each epoch not only consists of different variations of the stages, but each point is also composed of a process of dynamic and contradictory relationships in the game of dominant, residual, and emerging forms. Williams's theory of culture provides an analysis of the role that identities as an subversive and opposition movements play the dominant culture and how effective they are in changing it. The concept, yes. This concept is materialistic because, because um, it suggests that cultural artifacts, instit institutions and practices are in, in a sense conditioned by material processes. It is also cultural because it insists that there is no truth and material reality beyond that which sustains culture, that is material by itself. The media are essentially other means of production. Yes. Cultural forms should be seen not as an isolated text, but as embedded within the historical material relationships and processes that constitute them and with, within which they play an essential role. Human communication is socially productive since it is reproductive. In other words, it is similar to other production processes. The technologies of culture, of, of, of culture production play a crucial role in modeling in the cultural forms and institutions, but they do not determine them. Could you follow next one, please? Could you follow next one? Yes, we said that uh, next one, please. Yes. Uh, Next, uh, could you could you make another uh, move another another one? Next slide. Next slide. Yes. Yeah. Well, we said that um, that the culture um, has different as an individual and collective dimension of many values implies different concepts of the world, ways of feeling and acting that are embodied in the la the language and are framed within these different concrete societal social institutions that are determined by material circumstances. We can define the history of media as something related to the history of cultural production that is linked to some of those material conditions of, of social institutions, to different relationships with uh, other forces of production, to particular social forms, to the symbolic development of the society. Uh, could you move next one, please? Okay. So, uh, we could say that uh, this theory of culture is also interdisciplinary. It's based on disciplinarity. They have a multiple, multiple methods, such as political economy, context of creation, production, historical, socioeconomic distribution, textual analysis, regarding visual, verbal, audience code, codes, audience reception, media effects, ethnography, and other multiple focuses of inquiry. The theorism, Marxism, queer theory, feminism. Okay, could you make the next one? Regarding the term terminology of this, we could say that, for example, the structuralism that uh, will base the uh, well something different as uh, school developed in France. But I mean, mm, could you make the next one? The, the next slides. Mm. Yeah. Yes, this one. Uh, 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 um, yeah, okay, I'm finishing. I'm finishing. We I'm need finishing. to conclude now. Yes. Yes. Now we're concluding. Now next one is the last one. Okay. Next slide, please. This is last one. Would be the last one. Yeah. So uh, next slide, Joe. Recording. Yes.
Next slide, Joe. This is the last one? The next one. The next one is the last one. Okay, but Joe, next slide. Yes, sir. I think I think Joe's cut off. <laughs> okay, no problem. Well, Just speak through the, the last one. Yes. Yes. Well, we'll talk about the last one. The, let me check it for you first. Uh, okay, Joe, can you hear me? Uh, next slide, please. No problem. Okay, sorry. Uh, sorry, but no problem. No problem. Okay. okay. Um, can you conclude with? Uh, yes, thank you. Concluding now. Very quick, very quick. Uh, come on. I mean, in order to, to finish, that uh, we can have uh, some several, uh, as, a, as a way of conclusion, we could say that that common idea, some kind of culturalism and culturalism, for example, that's, uh, that's the structure as a as we could say, as a poetic of feelings, determine, determining the structure, it also comprises the position of its element as in a whole part between this, this, the sense, the feeling, and the idea. Um, because every system, including the poetic one, linked, closely linked to the political one, has a structure. And these structural laws are applied to a simultaneous coexistence rather than to change over time. Um, because the structures are real things that lie beneath the surface of the opinion of meanings. This is the, the way of the theory of culture to be to to summarize the the first one we could say that regarding the we we could say that the, the, this theory is based in three points. The he tries to to express the difference between I mean, between popular culture and mass culture, is uh, one of the main ideas he has. The other one would be the, the, the difference between high and low culture, in the regard uh, based on historic materialism, um, cultural materialism, um, uh, uh, mainly linked to the main idea of subaltern um, hegemony, the hegemony that uh, was defined by Gramsci. We should not get this point as a link or for this theory. Otherwise, you have uh, many thanks for your attention. Sorry about the technical problems and whatever you need. I mean, I know your disposal. Could you have, you have some yeah, questions? Yeah. We will have a question after the last session. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, My pleasure. Yeah, for your, <coughs> sorry for the mishaps, the technical mishap, technical hitches we've had. I'm not gonna comment except one thing now. Uh, it's a great pleasure. I've been looking forward to this. Poor old Handel, we left him to the very end. Uh, uh, but um, I'm dying to see this guy again after many years. Carmel has left, unfortunately. We were all in the same institution many years ago. Uh, Handel Kashope Wright from the University of British Columbia. We weren't at the University of British Columbia. We were in the most exciting place on earth, OEZ. Oh, it's so exciting. Um, now, it was interesting, uh, most people were mentioning the cross-section between education and cultural studies. And also, um, Ian Mentor brought in Paulo Freire into the equation. We just had a Freire Fest. Now, from the title of Handel's presentation, we can see some kind of connection between Freire and Raymond Williams. Critical pedagogy, <coughs> the articulation of critical pedagogy with cultural studies. Professor Wright uh, held for many years the chair, the, re the Canada researcher of cult in cultural studies in education, if I'm correct. <clears throat> and uh, he seems to be the right person, actually my, my, an ideal person to bring the two perspectives of cultural studies and education together articulating pedagogy of the oppressed with the critical uh, cultural studies tradition of Raymond Williams, Hogarth, Stuart Hall, and many, many, many others. Handel, the screen is yours. Thanks so much, Peter. It was great um, to see you. Um, thanks everyone uh, for, for being here. Thanks for the invitation, um, Peter and uh, <coughs> Joe, to be uh, at this conference. Um, I bring you all greetings from my home in the city of Richmond, British Columbia, Canada. I want to mm. acknowledge that this place that we now call Richmond, this place where I live, 
And mm -hmm. in this time of the continued global pandemic, the place from which I work some of the time is part of the traditional ancestral and unceded land of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Kwantlen, the Tawasan, and the Mosqueam. So um, as Peter told me about this conference, I thought about putting together uh, something um, around Raymond Williams and Paulo Ferri and my, my interest in uh, cultural studies and critical pedagogy. Um, there is um, a rather complicated relationship between critical approaches in the field of education on the one hand and cultural studies on the other. This relationship has been marked variously by shared goals, parallel theoretical and internal political developments, missed articulation, tension, and even mutual disdain, and active articulation and formation. Furthermore, while the relationship has been enthusiastically and openly engaged by some in critical education, it has been curiously underrepresented in both fields as a whole. In the present, things have stabilized in the field of education, such that to think of education in relation to cultural studies is to think of a formation that is cultural studies of education. In cultural studies, things are not only more fluid, there does not seem to have been the same ready incorporation of education into cultural studies as there has been the incorporation of cultural studies into education. In this essay, I want to address this relationship in general and its underrepresented origins in particular with the aim of pointing out that both cultural studies and education in particular might evolve somewhat differently if those origins, including the contributions of Raymond Williams and Paulo Freire were taken into account. But is it wise to go looking for origins, especially singular origins? Both Stuart Hall and Seamus Dean have warned against specifying definitive origins or indeed undertaking the task of searching for them. In part, this is because the task of identifying specific definitive origins is almost always a dubious venture prone to producing narratives that exclude and silence even as they unearth and articulate. Taking uh, Hall and Dean's wariness about singular definitive origins as caveat, it is perhaps preferable to speak of accepted and taken for granted origin narratives and to make space for the possibility of competing and or complementary alternatives. In the case of critical pedagogy, a popular origin narrative is that critical pedagogy evolved directly from the work of Brazilian education philosopher, Paulo Freire, especially his particularly influential early text, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Neo-Marxist based Freire and pedagogy's central notions, such as the critique of the banking method, uh, metaphor of education, the idea that education is inherently political, that literacy is about learning to read the word and the world, going beyond functional literacy to, to tying literacy inexplicably to understanding the politics of social life. The focus on how power operates in education and in society, conscientization, the oppressed development of agency and awareness of how power operates and their disempowered positioning in society, the teacher as co-learner, et cetera, et cetera, were all taken up by critical educators in the United States and then much of North America and beyond as the foundation of what became critical pedagogy. What this dominant narrative does not address is that critical pedagogy could also be said to have emerged from, or at least have as contributory discourse, the work of the Frankfurt School in general. <clears throat> and so another way of thinking of things is a dual critical pedagogy, one branch of which is a purist line from Freire and liberatory pedagogy into or as form of critical pedagogy, and a more complex, comprehensive Frankfurt and Chicago school thought plus Freire and thought and praxis based critical pedagogy. 
It is worth keeping that second more expansive critical theory based discourse in mind, in part because it is that version of critical pedagogy that has most readily informed the articulation of crit ped and cultural studies. Sometimes one stumbles onto alternative origin narratives, even when one is not necessarily looking for them. In an interview I conducted um, in the early 2000s with Roger Simon, I asked him what I considered at the time the innocuous background question. When and when did the term critical pedagogy originate? His response was that the term originated out of the work he and Edmund Sullivan were doing at the Ontario Institute of St uh, for Studies in Education in Canada in the 1970s. In short, his declaration was that crit ped originated in Canada. Now I have no interest in revisionist historiography, that is in replacing the taken for granted story of the US origin of crit ped with a Canadian origin story. What does excite me is the contribution that the Canadian narrative makes to producing multiple narratives of origin of crit ped and to rendering critical pedagogy a floating signifier. In the case of cultural studies, the widespread oft repeated and taken for granted genealogy is that cultural studies is a multi inter anti disciplinary academic response to a series of crises in the humanities and social sciences that it originated in its named and institutionalized form in Britain in 1964 with the establishment of the Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies, which was a few rooms in a corner of the sociology department at the University of Birmingham, and that its foundations were in the 1950s work of three founding fathers, Richard Hogarth, E.P. Thompson, and Raymond Williams. In other words, it is in the leftist representation sensitive social justice based theoretical writings of these founding fathers and in the theoretical and disciplinary contestations that were occurring around the time and somewhat later, including and especially the obfuscations of disciplinary boundaries that led to the emergence of, of cultural studies. From these complex theoretical and modest institutional beginnings, the genealogy continues, cultural studies spread to other British universities, then to the US and Australia, then to Canada and continental Europe, and finally to Africa, Latin America, and Asia. Not everyone has accepted this hegemonic origin narrative. In my own work, I have referred to this as, quote, the altogether too neat Anglocentric and ironically colonialist history of cultural studies. Raymond Williams, who ironically is accepted as a founding father, was one of the early and perhaps most consistent figures inviting cultural studies to rethink, indeed correct its origin narrative. Here's how Williams put the case for rethinking the origins of cultural studies and what corrective counter hegemonic narrative opens up in his book, The Politics of Modernism. If we are serious, William says, we have to apply it, that is conscious historicizing, to our own project, including the project of cultural studies. We have to look at what kind of formation it was from which the project of cultural studies developed, and then at the changes of formation that produced different definitions of that project. And what was that alternative origin of cultural studies Raymond Williams kept asserting was being ignored, suppressed, supplanted? The organizers of this symposium have used perhaps the most cogent version of his argument as the epigram, and it's worth quoting it here in full. We are beginning, I am afraid, Williams says, to see encyclopedia articles dating the birth of cultural studies from this or that book in the late 50s. Don't believe a word of it. That shift of perspective about the teaching of arts and literature and the relation to history and to contemporary society began in adult education. It didn't happen anywhere else. 
It was when it was taken across by people with that experience to the universities that it was suddenly recognized as a subject. It is in these and other similar ways that the contribution of the process itself to social change and specifically to learning has happened. Very, very clear statement. Raymond Williams asserted the adult education origin of cultural studies repeatedly, but cultural studies has pointedly eschewed it. In fact, education was integral to the work of the Birmingham Center, which had two consecutive working groups on education. But this is hardly known as histories of the CCCS have discussed the work on literary studies into cultural studies, studying culture in exciting novel ways than traditional anthropology, uh, understanding youth subcultures and addressing racism through texts on policing the crisis. As I have put it elsewhere, education is cultural studies, poor, supposedly unsophisticated and kept locked in the attic so that cultural studies uh, so that cultural studies is parading its sexy critical theory cousins when cutting edge visitors like postmodern theory come to visit. What would it mean for cultural studies to take its adult education origin seriously? It would mean in part taking seriously the pedagogical encounter as Raymond Williams did as both foundational and a crucial and expansive part of the very stuff of the field. In turn, this would bring cultural studies from constantly tottering on the brink of theoreticism as it currently is, and much closer discursively and in terms of its, the importance of praxis to Freirean critical pedagogy. And what would it mean for critical um, pedagogy and uh, critical approaches to education in general to take Raymond Williams more strongly into account. It would mean at the very least a, more, a much more sophisticated exploration of the very nature of culture and in turn its relationship with education. Of course, culture is already present in education and importantly so for some. Cultures, especially school cultures, mediate the process of students' identity making, boundary making, and societal material networks, as the work of McDougall, um, Carter, Bailey, and others have illustrated, while being part and parcel of local educational discourses, policies, programs, and practices. The concept cultures of schooling, for example, examines the ways in which aspects of sociocultural identity such as race, social class, gender, sexuality, ability, migration, history, citizenship, and various factors contribute to social stratification and operate in constituting social choice, family, school partnerships, admission policy, the assemblage of digital technology in learning, as well as students' experiences of alienation or inclusion in school. For Coe and others, quote, critiquing dominant cultures of schooling, end quote, is a sustained critical enterprise in sociology of education. To take Williams seriously would mean to take up culture in an even more complex manner. Culture, according to Williams, traverses linguistic, social, and intellectual movements in English and European systems of thought signifying complicated, intertwined, and sometimes problematic meanings and practices, various these notions of cultivation, civilization, art and learning, material production, a whole way of life, dynamics of domination and subordination, and various conceptual developments in academic disciplines such as anthropology. Williams has also declared somewhat cryptically, but very generatively, that culture is ordinary in every society and every mind. Um, that little essay by his is um, a, an absolutely beautiful piece of writing that I can read and reread and, and never get tired of. So I'll try to come to something of a conclusion here. 
This brief essay has produced a specific, necessarily subjective narrative about critical education and its relationship with cultural studies, especially in terms of singular versus more multiple origin narratives. Taking the British and adult education origins and especially the global presence of cultural studies into account and as, part, and as a starting point would yield an alternative to the taken for granted Eurocentric or more specific English and US dominant discourse of both cultural studies and education. First alternative critical narrative, the first alternative critical narrative would involve reiterating the very viable but constantly eschewed argument that cultural studies originated in the field of education. Most specifically as asserted by both Raymond Williams and Stuart Hall, cultural studies had its origins in extramural or adult education courses. Second, education was an integral part of the early CCCS, CCCS cultural studies project. Paul Willis's learning to labor is well known internationally, but far less known is the existence and publications of the CCCS education groups one and two, which were around 1981 and 1991. Third, beyond theory and liberatory pedagogy in the United States, there is progressive potential in taking seriously the alternative of the Canadian origins of critical pedagogy and a Canadian ambivalence that led to the emergence of Roger Simon's pedagogy of possibility and Magda Lewis's feminist assertion of Critped as, quote, a discourse not intended for her. Finally, taking all of this into account means reconceptualizing the relationship. As Carl Mayton and I have argued, it is not a matter of education coming to cultural studies, as it is a matter of returning cultural studies to education. What does this mean for education? To follow Raymond Williams and draw on, but when necessary, go against the grain of Marxist thought, I want to conclude by saying what all of this means for critical education, including critical adult education. In effect, Karl Mayton and I uh, have argued we are reversing Karl Marx's 11th thesis um, on Feuerbach to argue that, quote, thus far, we've tried to change higher education in various ways. The point, however, is to understand it in order that we might know not only on behalf of whom, but what and how change may be affected. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Handel, for, um, <clears throat> you know, I mean, this whole overview of the development of what we call cultural studies, I think uh, getting lost into the, uh, the origins, uh, there's always a danger that we essentialize, as you pointed out, and uh, I think, um, I, I, you know, re, re, even Henry Giroux, who works within this field of cultural studies, we've been discussing this even on on air on on a on a podcast like this, uh, organized by the University of Ankara, have come around to the fact to say, listen, you can say that crit critical pedagogy started at OISI. I mean. Uh, Edmund O'Sullivan tells me the same story you mentioned, by, by uh, told to you by Roger Simon. But at the end of the day, so much critical pedagogy was happening in different parts of the world. Maybe one of the tasks is actually to acknowledge that. How much of what we call critical pedagogy and cultural studies exists, for example, in indigenous knowledge, where there is a tendency not to compartmentalize knowledge and to look in, in, at culture in a broader sense. So while I do recognize that um, cultural studies, as Raymond Williams say, started in adult education and the Workers' Education Association, the extramural studies, but I'm sure <clears throat> elements of it will have appeared years before 
in various corners of the world. Exactly. And what will be interesting if we return, even in, in the industrialized countries, Britain included, <coughs> we would return to its roots in adult education, given the changing landscape of countries like Britain with migration from the 60s onwards. New stories, new narratives of cultural studies will be brought to the table from the students coming from the various parts of the world, some of which were colonies of Britain itself. Um, so, you know, this is it. And to say that, you know, so uh, I think the task now, if anything, is to, is to acknowledge and recognize the various forms of cultural studies. But anyway, this is the final general discussion. Over to you. Uh, you have the mic, whatever it is, whatever form it takes. Move it around amongst yourselves. And you can you can make statements, uh, questions, problematize issues from the last group of speakers since we had the last set of questions, and also <coughs> from all the speakers in general. And then we will wrap up. <coughs> Sorry, I have a terrible cough, and something's gone wrong with the line. Both Joseph is in comunicado and myself. Well, may, maybe to your great advantage and pleasure, you can't see my picture because it went off. <laughs> right, to spare you a nightmare. Right, okay. Well, so, if, I'm, if I may. Yeah, Chris. Um, Handel, thanks for your presentation. It was, um, it was a, lo a lot to think about and, um, and it connects with a lot of my history as well. I'm actually sitting uh, on uh, in downtown Toronto, just about five blocks from Oise. It's <laughs> it's in my neighborhood, and uh, the story of the origin of critical pedagogy is is one that I've heard many many times. And there are other elements to uh, the Oise origin story that I'll spare you for now, but maybe share over. Uh, it's better shared over beer than anything else. But um, but that said, I, I do think one thing about the origin, the Oise origin story, is that it's cited most often for me in the first sort of public use of the term. And so it's not necessary, you know. Roger may claim <laughs> that it kind of started there as a practice. I know mm -hmm. I've talked to him about that in the past, and Bud Hall, and and a lot of the mm -hmm. folks there because I know them well. Mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, the, I, I think what it comes down to is that the term, you know, was perhaps, you know, with a lot of question marks around that, you know, voiced there. Um, and there are anecdotes from that event that I say are, are better shared over beer. But I want to complicate things a bit more as well. Apropos of Raymond Williams, Frary, uh, critical pedagogy, um, by introducing the term that I don't think has been mentioned today so far of popular education. That's the world that I come from. I've been practicing popular education since the late 70s um, and in a Frarian tradition. And, um, and popular education, I think, introduces a complexity to this discussion uh, that is re that is that is important. Not that I'll go on <laughs> very long, but I sort of want to throw it out there. Um, and I'll say maybe two things. One is that when Frary sort of hit North America in the seventies, he was taken up by two different communities: mm -hmm. uh, the academic community <coughs> and, and the activist community. The academic community um, sort of laid claim to Frary very quickly. And, and out of that claim with Frary's residencies at UMass Amherst and, 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 and Harvard and elsewhere, um, in my opinion, was birthed the, the discipline of critical pedagogy. Um, it, it represented the intersections and Frary then acted as a connector of many, many traditions that created the term critical pedagogy. Activists encountered um, Frary, and I would say in a very Raymond Williams kind of fashion, you know, recognized the value of what Frary was talking about and took his work into a grassroots practice that became known in North America as popular education. And, a, you know, a, 
a, a slippery term because in English it doesn't mean it doesn't have the same connotations as it does in Spanish. Educación popular, mm -hmm. you know, education of the people, um, and trying to use the people anything in North America, you know, activates a, a an, you know an anti Marxist, anti socialist, you know, culture that's very deep in this uh, on this continent. Um, and so popular education has continued to fly under the radar of academic interest. And I'd say that popular education connects very, very strongly with Raymond Williams' practice of adult education the way he meant it. However, as slippery as the term popular education is, adult education is even slipperier. And, and that's one of the things that I think complicates this discussion is what we mean by adult education and who are the subjects of adult education. If you're apropos of today's discussion on Raymond Williams, we're talking working class, we're talking ordinary people. The word common was thrown out as well, common people and so on. But then we use the term adult education, which is, which is inclusive of all adults. It, 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 it's a little fuzzy, you know. Popular education uh, however unsuccessful it might be, tries to, you know, bring in a class consciousness to that term of adult education. It's referring to education of the popular classes. Mm -hmm. And and that then allows us to connect uh, not only popular education, but popular culture, popular communication. Um, popular communication is a term used a lot in Latin America um, mm -hmm. to look at democratized practices around mass media. A lot of radio, for instance, um, and it, and and I think popular education um, draws a lot on the theory when it needs it of critical pedagogy. So to me, there's a very strong constellation of relationships here between Raymond Williams' practice of adult education and what and his theory of it, popular education inspired by Latin America but practiced in many places around the world. Critical pedagogy, of which you give, I think, Handel a very good sort of um, rendering of, 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 of its origins. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I'm, I'm feeling a little incoherent and maybe hungry. Mm -hmm. the one, one, of, uh, one of the most worrying factors is that when certain areas like critical pedagogy, critical education, which would mean the same, become uh, academic prerogatives, you get egos involved. You know, the oh, yeah. system. So you'll have people who are doing what we call critical pedagogy or critical education saying, oh, no, 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 I don't want to have... I don't want to have anything to do with critical pedagogy. I have two people in mind. We all know who they are. But anyway, it, let them be the elephant in the room. Okay? And it all boils down to egos, the star system. And that makes a travesty of what Paulo Freire, what, what Raymond Williams uh, was all about. Raymond Williams had to face these things at Cambridge in his later, in the later stages of his of his professional life, trying to be the peacemaker between the Levisites and the others over there. <clears throat> you know, I mean, that complicates matters. You know, there are certain people who we would associate with critical pedagogy who would not easily accept being brought into the critical pedagogy account. And so they prefer critical education to play, say, if I would say, critical studies in education, because people will tell you, <clears throat> well, that guy was not, never in critical pedagogy, but we were brought up on his writings. I'll just leave it at that. That complicates matters. That's, that's what happens. And the other, the other sad thing, and I always say cultural studies in Britain, because I acknowledge there are different forms of cultural work which easily fit into the critical, critical cultural studies in different parts of the world. But I, if I go to to the British case, <coughs> we associate a lot with the, as Handel said time and time again, with the Center for Cultural Studies at, at Birmingham, Contemporary Cultural Studies in Birmingham. 
which involves so much work of a historical, sociological, anthropological, geographical nature. I mean, Andy Green is a product of that program. And his PhD is the book, Education as State Formation, came out of under Richard Johnson's tutelage at, at that center. <coughs> that center got phased out, you know that. It died there. The, the one place where it, which took, <coughs> which, which took on the role of a center for cultural studies became Goldsmiths in London. And their Goldsmiths does, does honor very influential people. You, you, it's an honor to give a talk there in the Stuart Hall building or the Richard Hoggart building. And you probably know now that even Goldsmith is being run down. It's run into a deep financial hole. It's gone bankrupt. You know that. So it's really, you know, we're losing these places, you know, where it is. For people coming from that tradition, it's nice to go there and see <coughs> the cultural production. Uh, ma the main thing about Goldsmith was media. Media was 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 its, its strength over there, but it honoured the the icons of cultural, if you can use that word, of cultural studies in Britain. Okay, Britain, Jamaica, because Stuart Hall was Jamaican originally. Let's, let's not forget that he went there as a Rhodes Scholar. So these centres will always be, um, you know, it's, they'll always be at a premium, and they're suffering. They keep suffering in many ways. Goldsmith right now because of the financial hole they're in. So it's a sad, it's a sad comment for something like this. You know. <clears throat> I'll just make a quick um, a quick comment. I think yes, people yes, are dying and, and we you know we we're getting smaller and smaller uh, as a number, and I guess people are desperate for their dinner and a drink or their breakfast, whatever it is. I just want to make um handle, I'm sorry we, we haven't time to pick up stuff within your paper. I'd love to talk to you sometime about yes. Marlo Ferreira, for instance. Um, the, 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 the neglect of liberation theology in Ferreira is a very interesting process of exclusion. Mm. That's my first point. Ferreira thought it was central, fundamental mm. to what he was doing. Mm. The second point is, it's a bit Anglo-centric, some of this, because maybe colonialist as well, I don't know, but there are popular education traditions in mainland Europe mm -hmm. that come from different kind of <clears throat> foundational points. I mean, I've been talking to a colleague in Italy and there are a whole host of influences there, including uh, even St. Francis of Assisi, for instance, let alone aspects of, of feminism. The third point I wanted to make very quickly, the workers adult education thing, that was a great bone of contention in Oxford extramural delegacy, GDH Cole, one of the tutors there, thought it, would, it was next to the most heinous sin imaginable when the term workers' education was abandoned for adult education. The sense that I make of it was workers' education and a whole culture surrounding it, which had to do with um, criticality, with the mobilization of working class people, of being based in working class areas, and, and avoided any kind of prescribed curriculum or any form of assessment um, for all sorts of reasons and was very much in alliance with the Workers Education Association. Yes, I yes. think it slipped into adult education because people wanted to broaden the field and you could argue from their point of view that workers education was in any case in trouble um, for all sorts of reasons. So I think it's a fascinating discussion yeah. to be had there yeah. but I guess we're all feeling a bit exhausted to take this much further. Yeah, I yeah. just want to say um, very quickly, because again, I, I have to be at another, <laughs> it's interesting how many meetings I'm at. I left this one to be at a meeting locally and then- What time is it there? Um, it is 11, 11 mm. 19 in the morning. Yeah. And I have to be at another meeting in Toronto um, <laughs> at Virtually, in, of a, course. in a few minutes. But I think people have brought up really interesting um, points. And I just wanted, I, of course, Lyndon, we should probably have a discussion. Uh, Chris, we should have a discussion. Peter, it's been too long, way too long um, since our OISE days. And it's, it's good to hear in your voice that excitement. Very, very quick points. I want to touch on something each of the three of you said. 
um, just to give a, a little bit of a, um, uh, a take on them. One, Chris, you're very right about terminology. And a lot of this comes from um, what terms we choose and how those terms then function. And that goes on with what Peter said and what Lyndon has said as well. But there's something really important um, uh, though about terminology. Peter, I take your point really that um, there are people who don't want to associate with prepared and some of that has to do with ego. But very importantly also, there was a very serious critique of how critical pedagogy had become standardized in some ways that some felt almost uh, oppressive. That was the feminist critique. So there's that as well. So even our Roger Simon that we both know very, very well, thought about it very, very carefully when he decided to say, I'm no longer going to say critical pedagogy. I'm going to speak to a pedagogy of possibility. Mm. Um, and th there was a conscious movement there, right? Mm -hmm. So some of, the, some of the critiques of critical pedagogy have come from what some see, for example, how masculinist it became, and some wanting to turn to a closer take on the pedagogical encounter. Instead of, we're going to change the whole world, we're going to change the whole society. Can we have a more modest kind of, yeah. which, which is what maybe even Williams was saying. Look at Williams's talk about the yeah. pedagogical encounter and see how critical pedagogy developed somewhat later. Uh, yeah. and, and finally, uh, to Lyndon, there, there is something in the US uh, and, in, and in North America generally that makes people a bit skittish about theology which is about bringing religion into things. Some people mm -hmm. would prefer, uh, what is it called? Uh, not, not religion, but, you know. Uh, spirituality. Spirituality, spirituality. Yeah, yes, rather than yes, anything yes, else. Yes. I am one of those people who are skeptical about what religion, the function religion plays when you bring it in strongly into pedagogy. Mm -hmm. Look at the way the right has gone crazy in its power and empowerment yeah. in the name of and a particular take on religion. So I think some of that skepticism might be coming from there. I'm not saying I'm disagreeing completely with it, either any of the three of you. I'm just saying there's another side to, to some of those arguments. And we could go on and on and it's and it and and the terms really are important for some about where they're coming from and why they've used particular terms. So pedagogy, um, um, uh, mm. adult education versus popular education, yes, very much so. And to take that, that my last point would be, um, as Chris started off, something about where that um, act grassroots work takes root. Um, mm. I was astonished uh, coming from OISE to be uh, at the University of Tennessee and to find the work of Miles Horton and working together with Freire to, to do a, a book <laughs> like We Make the Road by Walking. Amazing stuff about how somewhere in between mm -hmm. the activists and the academics is an intellectual space of that kind of um, collaboration with Miles, Miles Horton that maybe um, holds maybe the most hope for me. Okay. No. I have to be somewhere else in about five minutes, so I'm really yeah, okay. sorry that well, I thank have you. to stop the Thank you very much for making nice it. Uh, it was a pleasure to see you after all these years and to hear you, uh, although I do hear you on YouTube at times, <laughs> and uh, and I've seen you, I've, I've we've corresponded. Uh, Handel's been great, even when I was a student there. I mean, he was... Anyway, and uh, have, a good, have a good Peter, season, have a good festive yeah. season. Yeah. <laughs> Have a good festive season. Did you want to say something about Jerry? Yes. Uh, well, thank you. Nice to have met you. Well, thank you, Peter. I, I only tried to say that this this kind this this fight between adult education and the system has been taking place in Spain in the last few decades after the Franco's death. The young Franco's death in the, in the mid seventies. There was a fight supported even by the in the, in the deep of the church 
supporting this kind, this these studies or this this kind of um, spiritualization rather than education, because we're based more on the adult education system. People from from what the opposition to the to the Francoism supported this idea and started to create a new system developed by popularism, popularity, mm -hmm. not popularism, based on adult education and the first steps of theory of liberation, as you have said, for example, such people like Father Ignacio de Yacuria, who later oh, was yeah. assassinated yeah. in El Salvador, yeah. and even Father uh, the Archbishop, uh, Monsignor Romero, uh, was here even in Spain trying to support Arturio Cardinal, uh, yes, trying to support Cardinal Tancon, one of the <coughs> biggest popes of the church and one of the, the fighters against Franco regime. But this mm -hmm. is well, what happened. Later, all these people tried to, to develop here the concept of adult education based on popular education, something more related mm -hmm. to the public sector, to the government, something. Uh -huh. There has been always a fight. There's here. another discussion on adult ed, which we don't touch because it's human yes. resource development that's also is adult education. Yeah. But also, Spain, in my, in my view, yeah. is a very important area. I don't say it's the only one. Yeah. When it comes to popular education, popular yeah. education goes back to the Second Republic. That yes. was all about popular education. And it of was course. part of the reason why it, the whole thing was destroyed. You know why? Because, you know and why? the army coming in from Morocco. I mean, yes. the whole idea. Because there was this upsurge, mm. at least, which you always get in a revolution. It wasn't, a, it wasn't an election, actually. Mm. Yeah that you had in popular education. And then uh, Garcia Lorca, as you know, yeah. as you taught me, we were very yeah. much involved in this kind of... But there was a guy <laughs> from this region where we are talking now, <coughs> from oh. where we are, I'm talking to you now. This, this guy was called Jose Castillejos. He was the founder of the, Repu uh, of the, uh, the Republic of Missions that they yeah, would in, in Italy, to... as, 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 as Lyndon said, in Italy, I've written about this, Italy is, is yes. in traditions, but it is not yes. the dominant uh, intellectual force when it comes to writing about the subject. So yes. it's not just Britain, it's the Nordic message, which is nothing yes. wrong with Nordic popular education. I have nothing against Grunwe, mm -hmm. but there's, there's more to it than that, yep. Portugal and, and, and Spain. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I mean, yeah, that's why you have to go in very much international about this. And let's not forget, mm -hmm. we mentioned liberation theology. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, okay, we spoke about this in the Freire Fest a lot. Yeah. Uh, but people, things, are, things are, in southern countries, things are so intertwined. Yes. Where does the water and the juice start within the wine? They are so connected. Where you have a very strong Cartesian kind of thinking is mm -hmm. the you have that. <clears throat> for example, Peter. we have the Nordic hegemony in Europe. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but for example, Peter, the, you know that, for example, Father Milani was so linked to the to the written part of the of Jose Castillejos yeah, 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 yeah. 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 were involved in those in those systems. Yeah. Well, the thing yeah. is, you cannot separate one from the other. They're so inextricably like in Latin America. At the end of the day, yeah. mm -hmm. so and one thing I will mention, which we probably. Historically, I'm talking about now, mm -hmm. we tend to focus on socialism, etc. We ignore something connected to it, but not 100%. It has its own uh, anarchism. Yeah. Anarchism is a very important aspect of popular education and mobilization in Europe, to the extent that the Americans were much more scared of it than communism later when immigrants came in and were shot at because they, they had an uprising or whatever in the factory. And some were hanged as a result because they were anarchists. Anyway. Uh, Colin, you would like to say something? Really? Uh, well, no, what's, what's I agree with you. Uh, no, no, Colin, people are waving oh, all the time, so I don't know. Oh. <clears throat> Listen, um, if you don't have anything to say, we can call the squids. <coughs> you know? Hello, Ian. I wanted Ian for the Raymond Williams bit, but anyway, yeah. Um, so, thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. It was too much for a day, I know, but uh, but we didn't have enough to have a longer period. Uh, and, you know, like just straight after the Freire one, three days. This was too much. 
It was a very difficult conference to organize. This was much more difficult than the Freire one. Congratulations, Peter. No, no, it was difficult in the sense that when I try to organize something, I try to make it more inclusive <laughs> without, however, without tokenism. <laughs> it's so hard to get women who I know are very well versed on Raymond Willie to participate. One, because she had to visit her, her son somewhere else, that's Ursula. She would have made a very good presentation on new rats from the Vienna Circle and Raymond Williams. She had a book on that. I would have loved uh, Lizzie Eldridge and her father, John Eldridge, but I, um, who wrote a book about Raymond Williams. You probably know that, Lyndon, um, uh, to be there. Liz is a good friend of mine. She, she lives in Malta, in fact. <coughs> and that was it. So what is Colin trying to say with all this waving here? You are muted. Yeah, and mute, Colin. Unmute yourself, Colin. This is probably cracking a Scottish joke. <coughs> All right. Anyway, goodbye. Thank, Thank you, Peter. You. Thank you. Enjoy Thank the you. festive season if you can. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Nice to have with you. And be careful about our health. Okay. Yeah. You too. Cheers. Cheers, thanks. Thank you, Peter. Gracias. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> De nada. <laughs>